2, 3. Okay, perfect. We are live to today's panel discussion. Um, today I have again four wonderful guests here and we will be talking about crypto funds and many different aspects. And um, before we start with the questions right away, I would suggest we start with a little introduction round. Um, maybe Maximilian, you can start first and then we just go through the row. So that's gonna be the first tricky question. Is it gonna be me or the other Max? <laughs> I, uh, Maximilian Bada, please. Uh, okay, sure. Uh, yeah, thanks for having us. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Maximilian Bada. I'm one of the two co-founders of Q21 Capital. And Q21 Capital um, was founded back in 2019 when my co-founder and myself um, decided that um, yeah, we would like to capitalize on the high market inefficiencies and the high market volatility in the crypto space without being yeah, even more irresponsibly long, as it's called, in the space. Um, so we searched basically for managers that could capitalize on the high market inefficiencies with market neutral um, and trading strategies. Um, yeah, that's what we did. Um, and after a while, family and friends approached us and asked if they could invest alongside with us. And that's when our real journey began. We started setting up a proper fund structure. Um, we decided to go for um, a more conservative onshore vehicle here in Germany. So we are now a Bafin registered asset manager. Um, we launched our, pro our product um, back in January 2021 um, and launched a second product that um, is kind of the counterpart to the market neutral fund, um, which is called uh, Prudent Bull, which has a more long bias. And um, yeah, both products um, are running since then quite successfully and um, happy to talk with you guys about um, your, your setups. Perfect. Thank you, Maximilian. Then next we have Benjamin. Thank you, Christian. So my name is Benjamin Schaub. I'm the chief digital officer of Intas Tech, which is a blockchain consulting company. So we mainly focus on um, integrational aspects of crypto, but on tokenized assets in general um, for financial institutions. So this is, as I said, not limited to crypto. So we also look at uh, tokenized securities and so on. And uh, we help our clients to navigate the whole ecosystem. So what is necessary to uh, legally set up such funds, how to implement crypto, for example, into their existing processes and IT infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Benjamin. I'm very happy to talk about that uh, on a later question. And then next we have uh, Maximilian Bruckner. Sure. So. Maximilian as well. So feel free to call me Max and then Maximilian Bader. Maximilian, maybe we can have a distinction that way. Um, mm -hmm. I'm head of sales at 2186 Capital. We're a Swiss-based crypto investment advisor. Mm -hmm. So we've analyzed about a thousand crypto hedge funds uh, around the world globally, and we've condensed them also to a, a strategy selection um, that uses both market neutral and directional strategies uh, in order to create crypto-like returns uh, and equity-like drawdowns. So really <clears throat> trying to limit the downside risk while still taking um, the, the market returns that you're there for kind of in the first place with it. Um, we're also launching a new product, which is an index family, um, which will hopefully hit markets Q2, end of Q2 this year. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Max. And then last but not least, we have Paul. Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Paul and I'm glad to be here among this stacked panel of crypto crypto experts. I'm from F5 Crypto. F5 Crypto is a German-based fund uh, fund provider. We run the F5 Crypto Fund 1, which is a long-only crypto fund, and we try to achieve the highest possible performance for investors by investing only long into crypto assets. And it, we're now in the third year of operations, and at least yeah, last year we beat the Bitcoin performance by 10% uh, by double-digit uh, percentage return, so we're proud of that. Awesome. That sounds already great. <clears throat> First of all, thanks guys for all joining for today's panel discussion. I'm very excited because uh, I think I can also still learn a lot of from, uh, from you guys. Um, I would say let's dive in with a very simple question. I, I guess most of you guys um, will be operating um, 
probably from, from, from Germany or from some European country. Um, however, this question aims to like, where is actually most of the crypto fund business currently taking place? Is there like any locations that are like um, the hotspots where most things are set up or is it fairly decentralized over the uh, entire uh, earth? Would like to start first. I mean, I can I can have a go. I think there there are two things. So you can talk about the domicile of the actual fund vehicle, which um, I guess surprise surprise, a lot of them are in the British Virgin Islands and Cayman Islands. Um, <clears throat> or you can talk about where the actual teams are. So when you look at the teams and the uh, the people behind these funds, um, that's very decentralized. Um, I think I, I know a lot of crypto funds that work really around, uh, across the world, so they're online in all time zones. Um, and they're quite decentralized. As far as the domicile of the funds goes, we've seen a strong dominance in BVI, Cayman Islands. Um, Switzerland is also coming up, and now there's some there's some German-based managers. Um, also the UK, which from what we've seen has a lot of market neutral and kind of arbitrage managers emerging there. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I haven't touched on the on the Asian Asian Asia Pacific kind of side. That's also an interesting place. Maybe maybe Max, you have something there. No, actually, not that much to add. Um, um, I can basically just confirm what we've just been pointing out. Um, the fourth PWC uh, crypto hedge fund report just came out, and they are basically saying exactly what you've been just telling us. Um, I think about a third of the of the managers are located in the US, ten percent in UK, and the rest is quite decentralized. And when it comes to domiciles, um, yeah, I think it's more than 50% came in actually, and uh, the rest um, um, are domiciled in the other typical suspect jurisdictions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then maybe I, maybe just to yeah. add, I think uh, Germany could do far better because the regulation is already here. So we have. Uh, special alternative investment funds um, under the Fund Jurisdiction Act, which would be allowed to invest. However, this is not uh, happening um, with high volume so far. So uh, especially the, the bigger asset managers in Germany, they are lacking behind because they have then dependencies to their depositories slash custodians, which are not yet ready for crypto. So this is a bit sad because, as I said, from the regulatory point of view, uh, Germany could definitely be a hub for funds. Mm -hmm. Because uh, my question was already aiming also towards a little bit uh, like what was happening with FTX, right? FTX was located on the Bahamas, where it's fairly unregulated and you can basically do a lot of things uh, without um, being like observed by regulators. And um, my question now goes more towards um, who are your typical clients? Um, I guess um, for most of you guys, um, it's it's quite similar, but um, maybe you can elaborate a little bit on, um, are there already some institutional investments because many people are talking about that or how does the fund business look at the moment? And I think this also aims a little bit at what Benjamin just said on the different ways on how a fund can be set up. I can start again. I mean, lot, lots to unpack as well with uh, with regards to that question. So typical typical investors are, would be family offices, high net worth individuals, um, kind of the typical hedge fund investors, as you would expect. I mean, we are all hedge funds uh, in essence. Um, we've not seen a great deal of institutional adoption. I do know of some funds that, um, that are starting to speak to institutionals, um, but it's it's kind of... It's a big uh, volume question as well. So as a big institutional, really like a proper institutional investor, um, I'm not looking to allocate a million dollars. Like I want to allocate real sums. Uh, and if the fund is managing, let's say 50 million, which is quite a common size, most funds are, are under that actually, as far as crypto hedge funds go. Um, and I want to allocate 50 million. I can't do that. It's not, it, it's not good risk management to kind of allocate the entire AUM fund to it yourself again. Um, and then it's not worth it to do the due diligence for them to then allocate like a 500K ticket. So I think that's a big part of why it's just not not quite there yet. Um, I also just wanted to quickly touch on, on what you said, Benjamin, about, about Germany as well. And I agree that there's some exciting things that, that should be happening in Germany or could be happening. And um, 
it's just taking a little while. But also we mustn't forget that a lot of asset managers in Germany still have their funds domiciled in Luxembourg or in, in Ireland is also a, a big fund domicile place for, for a lot of big institutional asset managers as well. So um, I think we have to differentiate between that and between actually saying, okay, I want my fund to be fully domiciled in Germany, which is like, like a five, for example, right? Yes. F5 is from Berlin, Germany, and we work only with German partners. As for our investors, I can only speak what, what we are seeing, and most of our investors are successful business people. So these are either the individuals themselves who are investing privately, or their businesses that they're still in control of and running, or the holding company that accrues the profits from the business. And those are our main investors. Those are people that are currently able to see crypto as a developing space. Uh, this is something that is going to keep growing and they want to invest in great fund managers, in great funds uh, to take part in that. Mm -hmm. Actually, we, we already got like uh, our first question. I, I would be very happy to, um, to already ask it. Um, because it would have also been one of the questions that uh, I would have been asking next. It would have been, um, what is the advantage for investors by investing in crypto funds comparing to directly invest in a set of cryptocurrencies, um, which would be then self-custody? Depends a little bit on the fund. Um, I mean, every fund is different. It also depends a lot on your personal situation. I mean, if you're, if you're a private, uh, an individual that is, very knowledgeable, let's say, about crypto assets, let's say about decentralized finance as well, about self-custody, et cetera, then, I mean, uh, you go, you do your thing, but most people aren't. Uh, and typically in, in asset classes that are immature, uh, highly volatile, fairly inefficient, there is uh, a, something to be said for active management. Um, so active fund management, active trading, long shorts, arbitrage, market making, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's the advantage you, you get, uh, a strategy that comes with the fund, um, that's very, let's say concisely developed and, and, um, enforced by experts in that strategy, usually for fund decides what, upon one strategy, that's kind of what they're best at. Um, and so through that, you can outsource that and don't have to do it, um, yourself. You don't have to check your positions every day yourself. So again, as an individual who's only doing crypto anyways, fair play. Do your thing um but most let's say most people um that don't come from the crypto space that have the funds to invest into crypto funds remember there's minimum uh, amounts as well by extension wouldn't have the time to do it themselves also um and so they rather give it to into the hands of somebody who they feel is more capable Mm -hmm. And maybe to add, um, I mean, it also highly depends on the kind of investment philosophy that the investor has, obviously, right? If it's only buy and hold, yeah, sure, do it. Um, even in, like, especially in Germany, you have some tax laws that actually favor those kind of people. But um, um, as Max has already pointed out, uh, it's a highly ma market inefficient, or the market is highly inefficient. And um, I mean, those kind, like the kind of, yeah, asset manager that we are investing in, those are ex Goldman Sachs, ex Merrill Lynch guys, you know, they have done their jobs uh, in equities um, for 30, 40 years or whatsoever. Um, and they know um, what tail risk is, they know what it's, uh, what, what actually custody solutions are um, these days providing. And when it comes to trading operations, they are just top notch. I mean, um, it's, it's 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 a completely different game and then and also when it comes to fees or trading fees for example right if you have a high volume as a high frequency trader um on the centralized exchanges um that's giving you um, a, a big advantage mm -hmm. so, could, could you guys maybe name like the three most common strategies because i know buy and hold is probably what this was now most comparable to but I also heard now some other terms. Maybe you could just quickly elaborate on what are some of the strategies. I think like the the, the three biggest, if I might go for it, and like the three biggest that we are currently seeing are like on the one hand side the bucket market neutral, which is arbitrage, market making, lending, staking, yield farming, um, and then we got like quantitative trading strategies, which are usually long short and um, based on momentum, mean reversion, trend following. And then we have in the last bucket discretionary long, short, or long only trading 
Um, I think those are like the, the three biggest buckets that I came across at least. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd agree with that. And um, how is it about um, the tax treatment of such kind of funds? Because uh, I, and I was always aware that like you could trade perps, uh, for example, for Bitcoin or for Ethereum, and you would have, I guess, a better tax treatment. This is also true for crypto funds. I mean, the crypto funds are usually based in uh, jurisdictions where there is no tax um, on a fund level. Um, mm -hmm. The same is true for, for our setup and to the best of my knowledge, also for F5 crypto, which um, also run a German CCAF, same as, as we do. So we are also um, tax neutral on a, on a fund level. So whatever kind of um, gains and losses we produce, being it spot, futures, perps, options or whatsoever, um, yeah, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter that much. Or not at all, to be honest, um, which is obviously different for an individual, um, um, especially in Germany now that um, I think you can only, uh, I think it's 20K that you can um, yeah, um, wait against your, um, against your gains, basically, yeah, losses against gains. Yeah. I mean, there is, mm -hmm. so just to be clear, there, there is a tax obligation on people that invest in, in the fund yeah. <laughs> and then make gains and exit, right? So there's still taxes paid, but mm -hmm. so as, as Max said, not on the fund level itself. Um, and by the way, that's another advantage that I wanted to mention um, for people as opposed to investing themselves is there's no, let's say, switching barrier between infrastructure or technology. If you're someone who's who invests in funds in general, in hedge funds, et cetera, and multiple asset classes, then it's quite easy for you to go to your bank and give them the ISIN of a crypto fund and say, I want to invest in that. Uh, it's more difficult to set up your own custody uh, and, and learn about how to self custody, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm, I mean, there, there's also many risks involved. I mean, obviously self custody is always like, was like the big promise of crypto, but I mean, we recently even saw like one Bitcoin core developer who got um, yeah, hacked on his node and lost a fair amount of Bitcoin. So, I mean, there are certain risks involved with that either. So um, it always depends, I think, on the on the user itself. Um, but I would just like go once more back to maybe Benjamin, um, because we had before discussed a little bit about uh, the current legislation in, in Germany, and you said it's quite uh, favorable. Um, what is still lacking um, to maybe attract more institutional investment or what, what would you like to see in the near future? I mean, the, the main problem so far is that the offers that could be made, they are for semi-professional and professional investors. So it's not yet allowed um, to um, invest directly into crypto for retail clients. So this is, of course, a hurdle, but I think um, over the next couple of months and maybe a year, then um, retail funds uh, will probably be allowed to um, allocate directly into crypto. So I don't see that as a as a big issue right now because we don't even have the exposure yet um, from the special alternative investment funds so far. And as I said, uh, main barriers here uh, are still that um, when we talk about the biggest German asset managers, so um, DWS, uh, DK Invest, Union Investment, that they all uh, need their uh, current counterparts they have in the fund unit business um, to be ready for crypto custody. So it's really about basic um, IT infrastructure, but we will see solutions coming up here. So uh, Deka is going for a, for it, uh, DZ Bank is going for, for it. And uh, as far as I know, Deutsche Bank also, which would then um, help DWS. So this is this is currently happening, but on the other side, um, one major issue for the asset managers we are talking to is that they simply don't have experience at all with crypto and they don't have models on the one hand side to make their crypto investment decisions. They simply don't know how to do it. And on the other hand side, um, risk controlling and risk management is another big issue for them and they don't have appropriate models there anyway. So they are uh, thinking about what is crypto for me eventually is it is it uh, does it behave like a currency or like a commodity then they would use models they have in this fields and mix it up but in this uh, this huge institutions for them it's simply not that easy to come up with the solutions and 
this i think is is a huge advantage for for companies and the colleagues here sitting here in the panel who are really going for a product like they do right now and simply build it solution based because um the the big asset managers they are lacking behind years and it will also take maybe two or three years more until we see um, a heavier penetration of offerings on their side. Mm -hmm. Okay, then if, if nobody wants to add something, I would right away uh, go to the next questions from the audience because I think it fits here very well. Um, because the question goes in the direction what Benjamin just explained, it is how are crypto funds regulated in Europe regarding reserves, risks, etc. I think uh, risk management, especially after what we have seen now uh, in the in the recent months, um, quite some incident. I mean, not especially in regard to, to crypto funds, but uh, with FTX and many other tail risks that were sh suddenly showing up. Um, I think this is like a, a good question. Any opinions or like knowledge you would like to share on that? I mean, um, I could start for, for Germany. So in, in Germany, mm -hmm. this is uh, straightforward. In Germany, we have in the fund unit business, um, the management company or called uh, Kapitalverwaltungsgesellschaft and then the depositories um, and they um, segregate the capital from the management company. So um, this is this is a basic regulation that in any case, uh, the management company and the the um, company who then uh, take look um, or care about the funds are separated as such. So um, to invest in such products, it's uh, is probably the the best way that could possibly happen because it's heavily regulated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's it's the same pretty much throughout uh, throughout Europe, to my knowledge. Um, I mean, I can talk a little bit about structures in in Liechtenstein as well. And Switzerland, and it's kind of the same idea. You always have multiple entities that you're dealing with. It depends also a little bit on the license that you're able to to acquire for yourself. So, the, the let's say higher level <laughs> the license is, so to say, um, then maybe you can have one less um, counter one less party in between. But what we see in Switzerland, for example, there are a bunch of structures where you would have the fund advisor who has um, almost or very, very little license, but they will work with um, a fund manager who formally gives the orders um, to execute trades, et cetera, to, um, so in, in the, the, custo uh, the depository bank, for example. Uh, and then you also have a fund administrator who formally calculates the NAV and does all the like tax reporting, et cetera. So it's really very, yeah, it's quite strictly regulated um, and, there's no, there's no three arrows capitals hiding in, <laughs> in Europe, I would say, not, not with the structures you have there. And to add maybe, um, I think um, as of January 2022, um, all um, Kapitalverwaltungsgesellschaften, um, so asset managers in, in Germany for, um, for sure um, need to be audited. So this is um, like something like we did it from the very beginning um liberally but now i think every asset manager needs to be audited on a, on a yearly basis um, in germany All right so ultimately the point of regulation is that the investors are safe and for us at f5 crypto it's incredibly important that investors feel we are treating them safely our product is safe their investment is safe even though crypto itself has products which well as we have seen last year are absolutely not safe and we make sure we only invest in crypto assets that are highly liquid that are tradable and on liquid exchanges we make sure we store those crypto assets with a regulated entity in cold storage and we make sure that uh, our companies audited as well as all our partner companies that we work with are audited and regulated as much as possible. So we make sure uh, everything is safe, whether the regulation requires it or whether we do it voluntarily doesn't matter to us. For us, it's just important that it is safe uh, for investors and that we are a great option for them to use. Mm -hmm. I, should, I can perfectly connect that again with a question from the audience because uh, Crypto Pioneers again asking, uh, where do you guys actually buy your crypto? Because he's asking from Binance or from some other exchanges or how does it in general work? I think there's still a lot of uh, unclarity on that. I guess that question right. is best be answered by, by Paul, right? Um, as the other, like Max and myself, we are running a fund of funds, so we are not holding mm -hmm. crypto directly. 
um, I guess. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Right. So that exactly ties into my uh, previous answer. Where do we actually buy the cryptos? And this here is very important that we decided from the start, we're only going to trade against regulated entities and regulated meaning Germany regulated entities. We're not going to open a Binance account, which is somewhere. We're not going to uh, open a, an account with any American uh, companies. We're only going to go with uh, Germany regulated entities. Uh, and in our case, this is our main trading partner is Bankhaus Scheich uh, out of Germany. And this for us is very important because it makes sure that our assets are always with a counterparty uh, that we well can trust as much as is possible in this space and that we do not have events like FTX crashing uh, affecting us and it didn't affect us in any way. And if Binance or Huobi or whoever is out there as a large exchange has problems that cannot affect us or our investors, that's very important for us. Yeah, mm -hmm. so to add something to that, um... Right, as Max correctly said, um, when you have a fund of fund, you, you're not really doing that yourself. Right? You're not buying or selling any crypto assets yourself, but it is a big part of your due diligence process typically, right? To look at which counterparties are the funds using that you want to invest in. And this, I mean, this is not only exchanges. You look at custodians, OTC desks, brokers, um, even like API key management, cloud infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera, everything they use. Um, and to be fair, there is a certain compromise you have to do when it comes to the exchanges. In particular, when you're looking at more quantitative strategies, and I think more arbitrage based strategies as well, because you need to be able, you need to have some form of liquid derivatives and high volumes as well on exchanges. Uh, and then the, I mean, really you had three options, Binance, Kraken uh, and FTX. Now you have two options, <laughs> Binance or Kraken, um, and it, it sucks. Uh, and it needs to change. And I don't think I don't think it's healthy that Binance has like 75% of the volume in the market, but that's how it is for now. So all you can do as a, as a fund of fund manager and in your due diligence is make sure that, first of all, where possible, these funds are diversified over the exchanges. They And also that they have limits for what amount of their assets they can have on any given exchange at any given time, right? And that those limits are enforced. And then if you have that, then you don't have a fund that loses 60% because they had it on FTX because they know how to do risk management. That's kind of the idea behind it. <laughs> and and maybe to add, uh, especially due to the FTX disaster, um, there are also coming some uh, coming up some really nice solutions. Um, Copper, for example, one of the biggest custodians in crypto, they're offering Clearloop, which is basically um, off exchange settlement. So, I mean, obviously you still have, you're still running your Copper counterparty risk in that case. But copper, to the best of my knowledge, is UK regulated and um, also audited, obviously. And um, more and more exchanges are basically being onboarded in copper these days. So I really hope that within 2023, we are seeing um, yeah, a way better infrastructure that we have been seeing over the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. and maybe from, from my side also to add, um, the trading part is still... Um, also an issue for for huge asset managers because as maximilian said in the beginning they have to look at the crypto space from the theoretic point of view and then they say okay if we would allocate funds into crypto then we would are required to buy ticket sizes of i don't know maybe hundreds of millions or even billions at some point hopefully and um, so they really have to look who can who can cover this and there's still the need definitely in germany but I think overall for crypto prime brokerage services, which we will also see, I think, um, coming up more and more um, this year. And um, Paul also said, um, we simply need regulated places where you can buy your crypto. And uh, F5 Crypto does it with Bankhaus Scheich. We have in Germany also Coinbase, uh, which is regulated, and also Börse Stuttgart, which I think is also quite beneficial for asset managers as such, because they then simply have a, a marketplace. But um, as I said, the trading part is still a bit tricky because they would require to buy huge sums in short time. They simply um, yeah, must be reflected uh, in their strategies. And then um, this, is, this poses some risks um, for them. So maybe on a side note, I believe strongly if we see the first um, funds with crypto exposure here in Germany or more crypto exposure, then this is definitely limited to the maybe top three or top five of crypto because otherwise you wouldn't be able 
to have this theoretical liquidity in the market uh, where you say, okay, I now have a, a position of 200 million, I need to liquidate. Yeah, so as I said, still an issue. Mm -hmm. I think what just came to my mind was, um, or, or let's, say, let's say how I perceived always the, the, the crypto exchanges was always like Coinbase, public traded company, uh, SEC regulated, Uh, how would it be um, for, for any of your, maybe like also for the Thunder fans, but also for you, Paul, um, to, to use Coinbase? Would that be something that would be still suitable in regard to uh, compliance and to the regulatory standards? Or would that, would that already be uh, out of range because it's in the USA? I'm, I'm very curious on something like that. I'd say that Coinbase is definitely one of the more um, trusted counterparties, even though it's hard these days to judge that. Um, but um, with Coinbase, there comes another problem along and uh, it's just that, I mean, they have some liquidity on the spot market, but when it comes like they, they don't offer any options to the best of my knowledge, they don't offer perps, mm -hmm. um, futures. And I mean, um, whenever you have high frequency trading strategies, they usually go with those deriv derivatives instead of the spot market. So yeah, um, uh, they come with some limitations. I see. All right. Now, we at FF Crypto do uh, use Coinbase as well, but we're not partnered with an American counterparty. Uh, Coinbase has a German subsidiary, which has both a license for uh, custody, for storing crypto assets safely, and a license for offering uh, crypto trading. And we're currently using their crypto trading as a backup option. And again, this is a German regulated entity that is our counterparty, which to the best of our due diligence suffices the highest level of uh, security and and yeah liquidity and and all those things that that we look for and we're happy to uh, work with coinbase germany uh, as well yes mm -hmm. thanks paul and then I, i have to say i very much appreciate that the a that the chat is so active and b that they are also asking the question that i wanted to ask um, because um, uh, dish deep is asking um, is there a plan to integrate uh, ESG to facilitate sustainable finance. And I think this also maybe goes a bit into this direction of Bitcoin sustainability, um, because I, I'm aware of the trend that also were happening in the, in the regular fund business. And I know that uh, ESG always has been a big topic. Um, uh, what, what's your guys' opinion on ESG and crypto? I mean, you mentioned the, the I guess the elephant in the room a little bit is is Bitcoin or proof of work. So you could say I just exclude any kind of protocols or any any coins that uh, use a consensus mechanism that is energy inefficient. I mean, that would be the main argument. Um, I think we all probably have different views on the uh, real ESG score of crypto assets. I know also, uh, I think Benjamin, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think, I think you guys almost two years ago now, you, you published some sort of study on CO2 compensation as well, based on uh, based on Bitcoin you hold and you track. And I think that's a benefit of blockchain is you you could very, very ac accurately track uh, what coins you have, what you, how many transactions you do, et cetera, et cetera, and just um, at least try to offset that. Okay, yeah, so... Oh, Paul, please let me, go ahead. Let me say, so... Uh, we don't care about ESG classifications. I care exactly about one thing, and that is creating the maximal returns for our investors. Now, if somebody wants to improve the world, that's very honorable, and they can take the returns they make from our product to buy uh, offsets. They can uh, donate the money or do whatever they think is. But I don't think I should overload my functions, right? My function is to generate the maximal possible returns in this space for investors. And if I have restrictions that are coming from a different angle that I need to take into consideration, uh, that will not make me able to focus on the one thing that I want to focus on. So I do only one thing, and that is maximize returns for investors. And of course, we do follow the law with the ESG regulations, but we do not focus on uh, trying to make our investments fulfill certain standards. Mm -hmm. yep. And I just wanted, I just wanted to add that um, mm -hmm. again, from uh, speaking not for but about the biggest asset managers here in Germany, that of course they struggle a lot with the, the Bitcoin topic, um, uh, because simply for them they say, okay, um, it's still the reputational risk they see uh, in the room. So I believe that uh, that, uh, as I said, if we have more crypto exposure and so on, that this will heavily be uh, located into Ethereum. I would assume 
because um, the talks that we uh, dare have is if we add uh, crypto, then um, it's not a proof of work uh, consensus mechanism, uh, cryptocurrency. So yeah, that's pretty much the assumption. But as Paul also said, uh, this gives uh, opportunity to other companies. Um, yeah. Right. Uh, so one thing that people ignore is that uh, Bitcoin mining is electric, which is kind of green. If you think electric cars, that's supposed to be green, right? So I don't really understand uh, why people are so worried about Bitcoin mining. It's actually uh, only uses electricity, which doesn't cause any exhaust. So I think uh, people have a little bit of a mis missed image of what Bitcoin mining actually is. That's definitely true. But uh, the, the fights within uh, the huge asset managers, they are um, not to be taken, I think, because it's very hard to educate the people there. I'm, I'm totally with you. But on the other hand, um, I could assume reading the la latest news from ECB and European Commission and so on that um, Bitcoin exposure could be or could get expensive in the future. So the ECB already announced that you have to do something against proof of work and um, that maybe exchanges will have to offset their, their carbon uh, their carbon that they uh, invest in through crypto. I'm, I'm not saying that this is coming, but it is potentially a risk which lies here, but um, I think only for Bitcoin. Um, and as I said, um, there's enough uh, other cryptos to, uh, to buy and uh, invest in. Right. No, so that, that makes sense. So one of the beauties of Bitcoin is that it's an open system, which means anybody can see what is the hash rate, how much Bitcoin mining is actually happening, what does that mean in mining equipment, what does that mean in electricity that is being consumed. So you can actually calculate exactly what the offset would be. Now try to calculate an offset for something else that you use. It's incredibly difficult. But for Bitcoin, you can actually do it, which is a benefit of this open uh, new technology. And this may be, as a last point, this could be get very interesting for um, traditional assets because I hope that at some point the transparency of crypto will turn around to traditional assets where we then say, okay, before I buy stock A, um, the exchanges have to show what is going on in their IT systems and how much carbon they are producing. So um, I think right now, feels a bit unfair coming from the crypto sector because everybody's talking about crypto and Bitcoin and it's really, really bad. But I think this discussion might shift then um, eventually to traditional assets also. Six million, do you want to add something or? Uh, I think like the, the topic is already exhausted, but it, I think, you mm -hmm. know, like we just got to give it some time. It's with everything else, like big innovations just need some time to become as efficient as incumbent technologies. I mean, crypto is around for maybe a decade by now, and we've already seen like one of the biggest, one of the biggest blockchains reducing their energy consumption, uh, consumption of 99.9%. .9%. I mean, um, <laughs> what other technology can say something like that for itself. And um, it also highly depends on what you're comparing it to, right? Like Bitcoin, for example, like is Bitcoin mining compared to what, um, gold mining? Um, or is it compared to the, I don't know, central bank systems all over the world? Or is it compared to producing coins? Or like, you know, it's, um, um, it's uh, yeah, it's hard to, to make a um, sufficient comparison there and I, I just think that we are going the right direction and as I said it's just a decade that crypto was invented by uh, per se so give it some time and I think this is going to be a discussion that other companies are going to have um, as Benjamin already pointed out way bigger problems to prove that they are carbon neutral or something like that um, uh, and it's not going to be crypto at the end that um, has this as a big risk for itself only. Yeah, and um, even though I'm, I have to admit, I'm more of an Ethereum maxi than I'm in a Bitcoin maxi. But um, there's also the the S and the G, right? In ESG, right? There's also governance and, and social. And I think uh, obviously you can always just look on the on the environmental part for for Bitcoin. But there's also other aspects. And I think if you would incorporate also the other two features, um, you would maybe also come to a different opinion on on Bitcoin. But certainly right now. Um, the carbon uh, offsetting uh, is definitely still um, a very big topic. Okay, then um, I think we have 
One one more question regarding uh, custody. Um, maybe like uh, also maybe a good question for Benjamin um, because it's about um, whether the fund itself is always choosing the custodian or whether the customer has also a say in how the crypto is um, basically stored. Um, or a question to everybody: Is this um, always the same principles, or is there different approaches on how custody is working? So if you think, if you invest in a fund, uh, typically the fu the fund chooses the custodian, and it's it's also actually it's part of the uh, approval process. Like the fund has to show some form of custody in order to get get approved. Um, and so what we've at least what we've seen the most in funds is usually fire blocks or copper. Um, at least for those uh, domiciled globally, those are like to go to solutions. Um, it might be a bit different in Germany. I'm sure uh, Paul can shed some light on that. Um, I've also spoken to funds that use neither and say, well, they're, um, they have a multi-sig wallet and the ledgers are in some bank vaults and they throw away the laptops after every transaction or something like that. I mean, <laughs> that's a little bit more sketchy. Quite <laughs> costly, right? With the institutional, <laughs> with the institutional solution. Um, so, short art, like long story short, you don't have the choice of where the fund will store your crypto. You do have the ability to ask them before investing and do your due diligence to find out what their custody solution is, and then decide whether or not you want to give them your money or not. Mm-hmm. And um, one for now, last question, because then I think we went almost through all of the, the, the chat questions already, um, because I think it goes in a very similar direction. Um, it's about due diligence and um, what, what have been so far your due diligence procedures to analyze a different kind of crypto funds? What are you looking for? What are like um, things you would like to see or things you would like not to see? Um, when, um, yeah, maybe taking them into your, your product offering. I think the list is really huge and Max has already um, shed some light on that. I mean, there's so many red flags and um, also compared to traditional hedge fund due diligence, it's so different. Like you, you got to ask for things that are taken for granted when you invest in other funds, right? Like do they have an external fund admin? Are they audited properly? Where are they regulated? How do they do, how do, they do custody? Um, um, how they do operations, um, um, counterparty due diligence, um, how are they diversified across blockchains, coins, stable coins, um, futures, and so I like the, the list is huge. And um, I like I can only speak for Q21 Capital, but for us, it's always like the, the three biggest things, the most important things are risk management, risk management, and risk management. And um, yeah, um, I think everything else, like obviously performance is, is key, don't get me wrong, but there are so many funds out there and most of them don't um, don't pass the due diligence because of the risk management and security mechanisms at place. Mm. Yeah, so I completely agree with that. The question opens a bit of a Pandora's <laughs> box because you can really go whichever route. I think I'd also say on top of, so on top of all the things Maximilian mentioned, there's also your kind of mm. performance due diligence, let's say. I mean, you're still looking at sharp ratios, at volatility, at drawdowns at correlations, performance in comparison to peers uh, with similar strategies over, over those time periods. So you go uh, very deep down the rabbit hole um, of, the, of the crypto funds, so to say. And also mm. maybe like some, something that we are doing, which is I also think not a typical thing to do with traditional hedge funds is we do proof of funds calls, for example, right? Where we force the fund managers to log into their exchanges and show us that the funds are actually there. And another thing that is really important for us is that the managers have skin in the game. Like, obviously, this is not part of the due diligence per se. It's just a proxy. But um, I always feel more comfortable for myself investing in, uh, yeah, in structures where the fund managers are also invested themselves. Q21 Capital is the same. Like, my co-founder and myself, we hold about 10 15% of the fund. And um, this gives at least me always some, some peace of mind if I know that the fund manager has something to lose and got some skin in the game. Yeah, a hundred percent. That's also the more qualitative side. I mean, you look at, you look at also how big the fund is, right? Do they have sufficient track record? Now, when you say sufficient track record in crypto, that's not the same as sufficient track record for an, <laughs> for an equities fund. I mean, if you have, find a crypto fund with three years track record, solid track record, that's pretty good. Um, most of them are a lot younger. 
Um, yeah, another thing I wanted to mention, I think not how, no matter how deep you do your due diligence um, for some of these, let's say international vehicles, and I'm sure Maximilian, you can agree with me on this, there is always a, a factor X, uh, an unknown kind of factor. And it can always happen uh, like, I'm sure people did due diligence of three hours capital um, and and still these guys bought, I think, bought a yacht with some of the customer money, right? Um, so you always have to be aware that you are still, you're in the wild west, so to say. This is still still crypto and there are still some risks that you can't predict, um, but that's why you diversify, so. Mm. Uh, I guess it's, it's also, if you take a look at uh, Solana nowadays and also at Luna, um, I mean, there was all certain risks involved where I think, as you guys said, there's just so many more factors and it's such yeah, an unregulated market with like so many obstacles and so many unknowns where it's not always 100% clear on, for example, what crypto asset should I even put in the fund, right? Because I mean, I guess there must be a lot of fund uh, managers who probably had Luna or Solana um, in the past year um maybe until like february it was all good investment and then suddenly you know the things unfolded as they did and um yeah i get but you know afterwards. maybe this but maybe this is um, actually giving us another point why to invest in a fund manager instead of doing it yourself i mean it's our daily business doing due diligence on exactly these kind of products and for example like we didn't invest in a fund that had significant exposure to terra luna and um, I mean, back in the days, I always got this feedback like, hey, Max, why should I invest in your fund? I can just put all my stables on, on Anchor and get my 20% uh, net of fees or whatsoever. And I was like, yeah, uh, gladly the market answered that <laughs> uh, for us, but um, or not gladly, but unfor unfortunately it happened. And um, this is exactly another point why, you, why maybe an active asset management next to diversification that Max already mentioned um, is just key in this kind of space that you yeah, give these kind of due diligence things um, in in the hands of professionals. And I mean, uh, crypto is moving so fast. It's so hard even for us, like keeping track. Like if you are away for like a weekend, so so much has happened. Um, yeah, it just gives you some peace of mind, I guess, if you yeah let that part to people that are doing it on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. No, I, I, I agree with, I have to admit with, with Luna, it was from the beginning quite uh, obvious uh, that it was just a good Ponzi, you know, like there are some, just some Ponzi's where you can see it right from the beginning, I guess with, with things like with Solana, where, you know, you suddenly figure out, hey, wait, uh, FTX has been the piggy bank of Alameda, which I guess none of us was, was really like aware of. It's, uh, yeah, it's just... Bad for the market, but uh, as you guys also said, I think um, in the long term, the good players will prevail. And I think that's all what we are looking for at the, mo at the moment. Then um, I think uh, one question also from, from, from my side that I, I was thinking about, um, because my, my background is also a little bit economics and finance, but how do uh, most of maybe also Paul's your crypto fund or most of the fund that you're managing um, as a funder fund um, deal with volatility in the market? Is, is there, most of them are very happy with volatility or is it um, that there's many are focusing on very low volatility? Like how, what's like volatility doing to most of your, of your products? Okay, so let me answer volatility, how much the price goes up and down in a certain time period. Uh, of course, we understand and all of our investors understand this is a new and nascent space, which means there is more volatility than in other spaces. Now, we still want to offer a product that's suitable for investors. So we try to reduce the volatility a little bit, but uh, we're completely upfront with saying this is a high risk uh, investment asset class and a high risk investment uh, fund that we're offering. And investors must be able to understand uh, that volatility can go both ways. Um, but I also think that most of our investors, all of our investors uh, have an entrepreneurial background. They understand you need to take risk in order to make money. And volatility is something that should be embraced, that should be managed and it should be uh, dealt with. And only if there is volatility in the market, you can expect to have outsized returns, which is, of course, our goal to provide outsized returns to investors. Mm -hmm. 
maybe to answer for for one of our market neutral fund right like we we love volatility and we need volatility to happen in order to make um, some decent returns and um, that's why we embrace volatility um but there are different kinds of volatility right like uh, it's a it's a huge difference if you have like you know like what we've been seeing at um, uh, at the end of 2022 like a, a slow spot bleeding, you know, like people just selling spot on a, on a daily basis and just keep selling spot versus, um, um, yeah, for example, having inefficiencies between different uh, derivatives, right, between perps and, and spot market, for example, because of a saturation in any, in any way. So, um, yeah, volatility is not volatility, but um, in general, um, I think um, it's the reason why uh, those kind of extraordinary returns are are possible in this kind of um, very new market. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I mean, people usually don't have a problem with volatility per se, right? It's it's really drawdowns that you're yeah. <laughs> that you're absolutely worried about. And when you, yeah. um, and and that's I think the the issue that um, a lot of people that let's say invested first in November of 2021, they'll have an issue because um, drawdowns are also um, asymmetrical, so to say. So if you have a drawdown of 50%, uh, you need to make 100% plus returns to get back to zero. It's, um, how those kind of percentages work. So that's a big problem. Um, so from our side, the focus is on, on reducing drawdowns. And the way you do that is through um, market neutral strategies. And yes, you uh, there's a trade-off. So you trade off some of the... In very outsized returns that you would have through F5 at a bull run, right? You trade that off for uh, more downside protection. And ultimately, it depends on what group of investors you're catering to. Like I, I know I've spoken to family offices that don't like crypto at all, but they understand that where there's volatility, there's opportunity. So they just say, look, we'll do arbitrage and high frequency trading, etc." cetera. Um, doesn't matter whether or not I believe in crypto assets. Um, I'm just here for those returns, right? Um, and then there's the opposite side of that who are more almost with a venture capital mindset with a very very long term view um and are just more on the buy and hold side so yeah ultimately i mean you're you're in it because of the volatility that's kind of the a big reason for a lot of people to invest is you're in it because of the volatility because that's what gives you returns what you can try to limit are your drawdowns um and even then there <laughs> there are limits to how much you can reduce those if you still want to take the full upside Right. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking, Benjamin, do you want to say something? No, right. Okay. Because then I, I have two last questions from my side. Um, and then maybe we can all give a final statement about our outlook for 2023 since it's still uh, January. Um, like um, one topic that um, I'm not such an expert in, but that I was certainly following up on is a grayscale. And uh, Grayscale, I know for now they have a trust, right? And they always wanted to become an ETF. And I think they are also the biggest one. Please correct me if I'm just saying anything that's wrong. Um, can maybe somebody of you elaborate a little bit on, on what's the situation there and um, why no ETFs are being admitted? I've heard that there's one in Canada for now, but um, how, how is the current situation in that regard? So as far as spot Bitcoin ETFs in the US goes, um, the reason is kind of the sounds a little bit silly, but from what I understood, it's it's a little bit of a of a fight between um, the CFTC, Commodities and Futures Trading Commission, uh, and the SEC as to what to classify Bitcoin as, because that would depending on that, then it would either be like a security um, or a commodity, for example. Um, and so that's why you can have futures, but you can't have the spot market yet because that in particular, they're kind of in disagreement about. Now, I will say the whole grayscale thing, I'm no expert on, and I'm sure there are people here that are more deeply involved in it. If you want a good overview of the whole thing that has happened with this crypto credit crisis, FTX, GBTC, DCG group, etc., cetera, um, there is a section in Ryan Selke's crypto thesis for 2023 where he goes into this, what he calls the GBTC trade and how that kickstarted this whole thing that I really recommended read from my side if you're interested in it. That's all I'll say on that topic. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, because like, um, it was for me a little bit like a boomerang because uh, like one or two days ago, I saw the post on Twitter by Cameron 
uh, Winkelvoss, which is like one of the Gemini founders, right? And he was accusing uh, Gary Silver of uh, accounting fraud and uh, some other things. And suddenly you read, okay, well, Three Arrows Capital is involved here, which again is with Luna and then FTX. And so suddenly you always read about contagion risks. And suddenly you see, okay, it's 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 really like all there. And um, yeah, I would I will definitely take a look, Max, and and uh, read up on that. And then um, a last question from my side, um, because I mean, with ITSA, we are also very uh, heavily involved with like uh, DeFi protocols, and uh, we like stuff that also happens on chain. Um, there's like a, a product, well, let's say like a, a platform called Enzyme. And on Enzyme, you can uh, create, um, yeah, some kind of vowels where you can put in certain kind of tokens. And then I think they also automatically rebalance. Um, yeah, w w what's your take on that? Would you would you recommend something like that? Is it something that also interests you guys in maybe setting something like that up? Or would you say it's not interesting at all because of regulatory unclarity or some other aspects, costs, whatever? I'm very happy to hear about uh, about that from you guys. I mean, I think it's very interesting and it's always important to follow these kind of things if you're active in crypto. Um, but it's the same with DAOs and stuff like, you know, like I'm following it very closely and I think it's uh, it, it might be the future. But for now, um, like we've been saying that institutions are going to come into this space and they haven't been here for 10 years. And um, I think it's going to take them at least another 10 years until they invest in a uh, maybe not 10, but I don't know. Like, But uh, I think I think it's going to take them another huge amount of time to invest in a fund that is uh, built on Enzyme. Um, um, they, are already, they, they cannot even invest in alternative investment funds by now, or at least not in, not in every, uh, every fund, right? It's, I think it's just not um, worth spending too much time on, on hoping for, for regula <coughs> regulatory um, changes here. That's just my, my personal take. That's not a Q21 take, maybe. But yeah. <laughs> okay, so I absolutely love the idea, right? So I've been following them since, since they were called Melonport. That, that should be the same thing, right? And what they do is a fund on chain, right? So you have a fund manager, which is controlled by an externally owned account that owns a contract and the contract owns the assets. So what this does is it's an investment product, a crypto fund product that is 100% transparent. 100% safe because you can see on chain that the assets are actually there and 100% automatic. So if you program it, the returns will be paid out in such and such a manner that will happen. That cannot be stopped. So I think this model is the future of uh, investing, of crypto on chain investing, um, because it doesn't allow any Bernie Madoff. It doesn't allow any FTX problems. It doesn't require an auditor to be safe. It's just, it's just so good. Now that that's the promise. Uh, that's how it's, why it's amazing now the reality is of course that currently no one is going to invest in that no big money is, is going to consider that as a serious option so this is currently in the very baby phase if, if you want to call it that mm -hmm. thank you paul okay then we can already go to the final statement um because i think uh, 2022 was a rough year for I guess everybody involved with crypto, um, I, I noticed it myself, you know, there's uh, quite some people who came to me and said like, well, I'm just happy that it's now 2023. Um, but obviously, I think the, the idea should be just to keep building and just going forward. And I think um, there's like good times ahead again. And um, I, I, I'm not, I don't like those questions that much, but somebody in the chat was asking like, what's your forecast for the Bitcoin price, you know? I mean, nobody can forecast the Bitcoin price, but um, maybe each of you guys can take give like a quick uh, five, 10 second take on what you expect for um, 2023. Is, will there be more blood uh, in the market or do you think that we have already seen the, the, the lows or whatever you expect? Feel free to say whatever you like. You don't necessarily have to comment on any prices or something like that. Maybe Maximilian, you can start first. I think currently, like we are so closely correlated to macroeconomics that it's really hard to uh, predict whether direction we are going to go. Um, I think especially job market data in the U.S. is kind of crucial for for the Fed um, yeah, um, on what kind of steps they're going to take next. So, um, yeah, we have seen a lot of sell pressure at the end of the year. Um, we're going to see some 
probably going to see some quarterly redemptions in March again, like from people that got scared at the end of last year and yeah, handed in their redemptions. So maybe some funds are going to have a, a sell-off at the end of the quarter again. In general, if nothing in macroeconomics um, changes in a bad way, I would be optimistic for uh, 2023. Um, <laughs> but I've been too long in crypto that I would um, that I would give a price tag to Bitcoin or ETH or whatsoever. That would be um, yeah, suicide. <laughs> so yeah, I, I, I can fully understand. I can fully understand. Uh, thank you, Maximilian. Then Benjamin, Benjamin, you also don't have to comment on any prices. Maybe you can also give an outlook on um, your expertise in regard to what happens uh, in uh, regulatory standards. Yeah, I think um, this year will probably be tough uh, as well. We can see it uh, by c the cutting of the workforces uh, with crypto exchanges continues. But I believe that, um, like Maximilian said, um, when the macroeconomic situation changes, that um, we will see uh, the biggest offering to, to clients in crypto that uh, was ever available. So um, as I said, especially in Germany, we will see the biggest uh, bank set up crypto custody um, during this year. And this means that then for 2024, for example, if the market sentiment changes, then um, many uh, professional investors or SEMA professional and of course retail investors uh, will have access to crypto, which they simply hadn't before. And therefore, I'm quite optimistic, but it's very tough to say um, when will this time be. Uh, it could even last for two years. It's very tough. Yeah. Hey, I, I fully agree, Benjamin, because recently my, my neighbor was asking me also about crypto. And um, yeah, so I think there's a lot of people who are currently just waiting for the right moment. And I guess you will probably write with your uh estimation and then uh, next we have max uh yeah so i think the two already summarized most of the things um i don't think it's realistic to to expect some form of decoupling from the macroeconomic trends we're seeing with the crisis um i think regulation is a big thing to look out for this year um, with everything that happened in 2022 i think it's fair to say that we might not be over the hump yet uh, in regards to that contagion there. I mean, there might still be some hidden things um, going on. And in regards to institutional adoption, institutions coming out, <laughs> I have a, a quote I like a lot again from, from Ryan Selkis, but, but, but he tweeted uh, already 2021. He said that, I mean, crypto built a $2 trillion financial market from scratch in less than 10 years without any institutions and with active encumbrance from government. Um, and I think that's something that even today we can all be proud of of being in the space and and working on that. And um, with that in the back of your mind, I think 2023 will be uh, a lot easier to get through. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Max. And then last but not least again, Paul. Right. So what we're seeing in the space is that the builders are here, the smart people are still coming in, the new ideas are still being tested and built out. And we see more and more bigger companies, uh, programming firms, telecom, T-Systems working on, on crypto projects at an unprecedented scale. Uh, we see players like Sparkasse working on, on crypto projects. Um, as was said, the regulation is, is partially accelerating all of that. So what we're seeing is that the space is growing at a rate that is faster than before the previous run-up. And whenever the ground layer that is necessary for price increases is being laid and is growing, that only means one thing for the eventual price. Now, let's talk about price, right? So we've seen a lot of panic selling last year, as well as forced liquidations, which, in my opinion, depressed the price below what could be considered a fair price. So I think we're currently uh, below a fair, a fair valuation for some of the leading crypto projects. Um, I don't believe that will quickly revert to whatever is a fair valuation. I think the first half of the year is going to be uh, a bit of a balance of those people who are still forced to sell, who still need to liquidate a little bit, uh, competing with those who are sort of in their DCA strategies who are saying, well, I'm going to allocate a little bit each year. And I think that's going to hit a tipping point somewhere in the first half of this year. And towards the second half of the year, I think the prices are going to be up uh, looking from, from today. So let, let me uh, end this with a couple of numbers. Uh, I think end of the year, we're going to see Bitcoin uh, around 30, 35,000. And we're going to see Ethereum around uh, two, two and a half thousand. Okay, perfect.
then I think uh, I hope that the uh, chatter is also happy with that answer because now you got at least some numbers. Um, I want to thank all of you guys for, for joining for today's panel. It was for me very insightful. I learned a lot of things from you guys. Uh, also, thank you very much to the chat, uh, asking all those great questions. And then, um, yeah, I wish you guys still a very uh, good week, a successful week, and let's talk soon again. Maybe we can have another panel uh, mid to end of this year. Would be very exciting to me. Thank you, Chris. Great. Thank you for moderating. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So. Okay.